It's good to be here again with you. Today, our scripture is taken from Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. So as you follow along uh, this message, you may want to have your Bibles with you, whether it be digital or in a form of a book, just have it with you. Romans 5, verses 1 through 11. Now, last month, February, was a, a difficult time for some people. We have been conditioned to believe that Valentine's Day, February 14th, is a time for romance. Girlfriends and wives expect meaningful romantic gifts or events that remind them that they are loved. Boyfriends were at a loss as to what to do and husbands felt obliged to do something so as not to look too bad in the eyes of their wives. Yet, for many single people, they longed for February 15 because there wasn't anyone with whom they shared the day. No one sent a card or flowers. No one said, I love you. She was by herself, alone, and maybe lonely. He sat at his desk and heard others in the office tell their romantic stories, but couldn't join in because he didn't have a romantic interest. Now, to be alone for periods is important for us, but to be lonely for even a short time goes contrary to our nature. God made us with a desire to bond with others, to share, to grow together, and to communicate with. There is something within us that cries out for company, and especially companionship. There are very few people who, if given a chance, will choose to be alone. Loneliness does not only take place, however, when a person is alone. Some who are lonely, <clears throat> even though surrounded by family and friends, even in the middle of a party or a celebration, it is possible to be lonely. Maybe the greatest loneliness is when you are lonely in a marriage. No doubt there are some watching this who have experienced loneliness at some point in their life. It is a feeling that just creeps over one's entire being. It is a feeling that says that no one really cares about you, that you're not important, that you are insignificant. If you were to die alone, no one would miss you. Now, that is not necessarily a fact, but the feeling is real. It is a feeling that cries out for someone to love, someone to love you in return, someone to hug, someone to be with, someone with whom to share an experience or an event, sometimes just to feel their presence. It is an emptiness that yearns to be filled, a longing that aches for satisfaction. It is a need that until met will leave the person feeling restless and troubled always searching for, seeking someone with whom to share a life. Perhaps it was to this that John Lennon and Paul McCartney wrote that well-known song in the 60s, All You Need Is Love. I have borrowed the name of their song for the title of this message because, like them, I believe that all you need in life is love. However, the belief I share with them has only to do with the truth of the statement and nothing more. The love of which they sang deals with human love, primarily the love between two people. And today, people are just longing for love. Even those who say that they are uh, dedicated single people and are happy to be single 
are usually happy being single until Mr. or Mrs. Wright comes along. Then all thought of singleness simply disappears because an opportunity to be with someone whom they can love and who will love them back equally, if not more, is far more satisfying. And even though one out of every two marriages are still said to be end in divorce, weddings are not going out of fashion. Even for those who do not follow the morality of God, they still have a longing for shared love and are living together as maybe common law husband and wife. It seems that all you need is love. Now, when couples come to me for premarital consultations, I usually ask them the reason they want to be married. The common response among younger couples is, we love each other. They're not thinking of the difficulties of life, the challenges of being married, or even the fact that sometimes they do not even have enough money to live on. But their belief is so strong that as long as they love each other, everything will be all right. Now, we know that that is not necessarily true, but they will not entertain the thought, not when they think all they need is love. If only, if only we could all grasp that all we need is love, not man's love, however, but God's love. I am convinced that when we experience the love of Jesus, the love of God, we will recognize that all we need is the love of God. All that we need to satisfy our every longing, to quench our aching desire, is the love of God. David the psalmist in the Bible recognized it and he sung that wonderful song in Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. What more is there? What is so satisfying about God's love? What is it? Well, the scriptures tells us in Romans 5, verses 6 through 11. It, tell, it tells us this, beginning at verse 6. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a, a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But, says verse 8, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? Verse 10, for if while we were God's sinners, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? And finally, in verse 11, it says, not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have received reconciliation. Before we proceed looking at this ver these verses, however, we need to go back a little further, uh, maybe to the very beginning of the book of Romans, chapter 1, verse 18, where it says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Also, in chapter 2, verse 15, but by your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath, when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. Now, these two verses, passages of scripture, among others, speak about those who are not in God's kingdom 
of righteousness. People who, even though they might even attend church, but have not submitted themselves to him as their savior and Lord. They are just attending church. They are counted by him as wicked or unjust. People who live as if he does not really matter or who treat him with impunity. In other words, people who are under the dominion of sin. Generally, the wrath of God is the same as God's holy displeasure at sin. However, it is more than that. To Paul, the author of the book of Romans, it is a terrifying reality. He says in Galatians 6 verse 7, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. Listen, as long as God is God, he cannot look with indifference as his creation is destroyed and his holy will cast down to the ground and trodden on. He cannot stand back and see people being abused, innocent being killed, uh, persecuted, enslaved. Therefore, he meets sin with his mighty and all-consuming reaction. The person who has departed from God and placed himself in sin is therefore under God's wrath. A person who has chosen sin instead of God has declared war against God and has made himself an enemy of God because he has aligned himself with the side of the devil. So on the day of judgment, God's wrath will be poured out. So to live outside of Christ then is to live under the threat of the wrath of God. And death rules. And we are constantly reminded of his presence. This is an awesome and, and frightening reality. So in Romans 5 verse 1, Paul could say that because of Jesus Christ, we are free from the wrath of God. The chapter opens by saying that the death of Christ on Calvary has put us right with God. Through Jesus, we are justified. That is, according to Paul, we are forgiven. We are given a clean slate. No sin is laid to account. God regards us as sinless and perfect. So next weekend... As Christians around the world celebrate Easter, we do so because we are remembering what Jesus did when he walked up the hill to Golgotha and was nailed on the cross to bear our death and our punishment. I can celebrate Easter because it means I have been transferred from being under the wrath of God and placed in God's righteous kingdom. So in verse 1 of Romans 5, Paul says that we have peace with God. Now, this is not peace, as we often hear it defined, you know, as a, an absence of hostility or a, a settled, calm state of mind. Rather, it speaks about a relationship, one that is mutual between God and man. It also stands to reason that when we are in right relationship with God, we will have an inner calm and a tranquil nature. There is peace because such a person is no longer hostile to God. You see, the sinner is always hostile to God always reluctant to serve him, and always looking for ways to avoid God and his people. But when Jesus died on Calvary and bore my sin and your sin, and we gladly and gratefully accept his gift of freedom, God's wrath is removed because there's no sin for his wrath to be poured out on. It was all poured out 
on Jesus who bore my sins. Now all our hostilities have been removed. We are at peace. The text says that it is through Jesus who bore the wrath for us. It is always through Jesus. It is never anything that we decide to do. We do not even have the power to decide to choose right, much less to do anything about it. It is always Jesus who moves us to do so. And verse 2, and hopefully you are following in your Bible. Verse 2 of Romans 5, 1, of Romans 5 shows that peace is always associated with grace. In Paul, they are inseparable. To stand in grace is the opposite of standing under wrath. And it allows us to reach the highest that the Christian life can reach. That is, to share in God's glory. Peter says that through Christ, we get to be partakers of the divine nature of God. You can read that in 2 Peter 1, verse 4. When we sinned, we fell short of the glory of God. But through grace, we can share in the divine glory of God. This is how far Christ has brought us when he died for us on Calvary. But Paul does not stop there. In verse 5, and following on, he says that, we can be in right relationship with God and experience His grace because of one thing, the love of God. So one moment, we are deservedly under the wrath. Then through the act of Christ, we are in the kingdom of righteousness. How? Simply because of the love of God. It is hard to find a way to describe the love of God because there are no human parallels. The best demonstration of human love, uh, the deepest expression of human love cannot be compared to God's love. It is different. It belongs to another realm. But because God is who he is, he brings his love into our realm, into our experience, and he brings us salvation through his love. Let us consider 1 John 4 verse 8, where it says, Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. So love is not something that he feels but rather it is something that describes him. It is the essence of God, his being, his existence. Our love is usually awakened by someone or something. Often human love has to be stimulated. And even the most wicked person can show the deepest love. But with God's love, his love does not need to be awakened. It does not occur as a response to us, but exists independently of us. Its basis is in Him, because He is love. 1 Corinthians 13 verse 5 describes it accurately when it says that love does not seek its own. You see, human love looks for a response, to be loved in return. God's love is about giving. Human love is conditional. We love for a time while love is being returned to us. But God's love is unconditional and has no limit. So looking at verses uh, five, uh, 6 through 9 in Romans, we see there that God's love for us went beyond how we felt or thought about him. His love is not motivated by us, but by his being. As someone once said, 
God's love springs forth spontaneously from his own fountain. And the greatest expression of this love is by giving Christ to us. This is what fascinated Paul. God's love is demonstrated by the giving of his son. And throughout the New Testament, this is repeated. Let me give you a couple of verses. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Also in 1 John 4, verses 9 and 10, it says, this is how God showed us his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Romans 5 verse 8 says, But God proves his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Now, we must not miss the significance of this. First, God so loved that he gave. His love is in his giving. Secondly, he gave his son. I think God used this expression for our understanding. I remember seeing both my daughters being born. I knew I loved my wife, but when I held the new life in my arms, I realized that I did not know that there were depths of love beyond my imagination. There was an immediate bond with each of my children as they were born. And from that moment, I was willing to do anything for them. I would go hungry to see them fed. I would do without clothes to see them clothed. I would undergo misery to see them happy. And I know that I would give my life so that they could live. Human nature is completely protective over its young. It is for this reason that any society today, today society rises up in anger at a parent who intentionally hurts its offspring. And no greater pain do we have to endure than to bury our children. This is because our future resides in our children. Our identity, our name is carried on by our children. Childless couples, sadly, cease to exist at death. But people with children live on through their descendants. So to willingly give of one's own child is a sentence one's self to oblivion, to remove self from existence. So, humanly speaking, for God to send his son to die took a love that we cannot begin to understand. Yet, that is not all. Verse 6 says, he did this while we were ungodly. That is, when we had no desire for him. Verse 8 says, while we were sinners. So, we were not even trying to serve him, but we were in active rebellion against him. So verse 10 describes us as being his enemies. Now, this does not mean that he was against us, but rather we were in league with the devil in open warfare against the Savior. It was at this time, under these conditions, that God gave his son for you and for me. And so now back to verse 5. It says, God has poured this love into our hearts through Christ. God's love has been filled the cup to overflowing and has been poured into us. This is an expression to describe the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a represent representative of God's love within us. According to Paul in 2 Corinthians 1 verses 2 forwards, the function of the Holy Spirit 
is to be a guarantee or a warranty in our hearts that we belong to Christ, that we are in him, that we are loved. So when Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, wrote these words, he must have been reflecting on the love of God for him. As Saul, he was a declared enemy of Christ. He had persecuted the Christians and he was now on his way to Damascus to find more Christians to imprison and kill. And on his way, he met Jesus on the road. At that moment, Saul, who later became Paul, who was an enemy, a declared enemy of Jesus, someone waging open warfare against him, was slain by the love of God. What do I mean? As he was on his way, suddenly the love of Jesus flashed from the heart of heaven to Saul. It was so powerful that he fell to the ground and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Saul asked, who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Acts 9 verses 4 and 5 tells us that Jesus did not strike down Saul with the wrath he deserved, but he offered him love instead. And even as he was helped into Damascus as a newly blind man, he must have marveled at how God had dealt with him in love and in mercy. In his blindness, he could now see Jesus hanging on the cross and knew it was God's love for him, for him, Paul, that caused Jesus to be on that cross. He could not understand such a love, but he knew that because of it, he was now right with God and it thrilled him. He could not explain it, but he simply accepted it. He was so overwhelmed by the love of God that the word he uses for it, agape, he does not use to describe our love for God. He reserves that word to describe God's love for you and for me. Today, we can neither understand nor explain God's love for us. All we know is that when we accept God's love, like Saul, we become new people. He became Saul. Something happens in our life that transforms us. We find that our every longing is met and our loneliness is removed because we, are, we suddenly discover that Jesus satisfies us. God meets our every need. And when I stop to think of Jesus in Calvary, dying for me, and I think of the love of God in sending him, like Paul, I cannot help myself, but I'm drawn to him by such a love, and I'm humbled by his grace. This must have been the same feeling that Stuart Hine had when he wrote the lines of his favorite, famous song. The lines are, and when I think of God, his son not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in, that on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Just imagine, or just to think that God would love me so. I know how wretched, wretched I am. In honesty, God has no business saving me. I know this, he knows it, and the devil knows it. But the words of Romans 5.20 says, Where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. And this tells me that his love 
reaches even me. And if it reaches me, it will reach you as well. There is maybe someone watching this broadcast who needs prayer. Maybe you feel lonely, isolated, feeling far from God and his love. But today, you know that God's love can reach even you. You can open your heart and your life to receive God's love because he gave his son Jesus to take your place, to suffer the wrath you deserved so you may be saved in his kingdom. And you may experience his love in your life today and every day as you open your heart to receive him. It is because his love is drawing you. God is love. All you need is love. Love is all you need. The love of God is all you need. Let us pray. We thank you, Father, for your, for your marvelous love. As that man or woman who has heard your message is willing to receive your love in their life, I pray, Lord, you'll forgive them of, your, of their sins. You'll no longer count their sins against them. They will be forgiven and brought into your kingdom and so experience you in their life. And know, Lord, that you will satisfy them. They'll never be lonely because you will be by their side. We thank you, Father, that as they make this decision, that you will bless them abundantly in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, if you'd like to reach out to us, you may do so by going to our website that is uh, kinesafellowship.com or you may want to visit us uh, in our worship. We worship on a Sabbath morning, a Saturday morning at 1655 Wilson Avenue in uh, uh, North York, Toronto. We'd love to see you. God be with you. See you next time.